No, I had to get out and go back oh, in. Be, be careful for what you said. Hi, Morning. Bernie. Morning. Hi, Bernie. Last week this time it was two degrees outside. Here now it's in, in the middle 60s. Oh, Hello. yeah. Well, it's supposed to get up in the high high 80s here tomorrow, I think. Hmm. Today. Hey, bye. We can see you. Can you hear me? Rabbi. Yes. Can you hear me and see me clearly? Yes. Uh, you're a little bit soft, but yes, we can hear you. A little bit soft. Okay, how about now? Yeah. Fine. I got gotcha. you. I'm learning how to use a Chromebook. Oh, congratulations. Yes, well, you like it? Up. Shirley told me a few months ago she bought a Chromebook. So, of course, I had to buy one too. So. <laughs> And I like it very much, but there's some things that don't work the same way as the Windows. <laughs> Reva, did you get my email? Which one was that, Cy? About God. Uh, <laughs> I'm not everybody. sure. I <laughs> think God incep intercepted it. Yes. Right. <laughs> I'm well, checking I see right now. You. I see you didn't get kidnapped. Not yet. <laughs> I'm in hiding. You're hiding? It looks like it. <laughs> I was going to try to find a better background in Mech, but. It's very bright behind you, yeah. But this was sort of the best I can do. This is where the couch is in the room. And where are you? In a hotel in Mazalan, Mexico. Oh, oh wow. wow. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, wow. I like the detail on the. Yeah. Uh, Very nice. Sorry, I didn't receive uh, your email. I can't find it in my, in my inbox. Okay, I'll send you a new one. Thank you for taking Thank the you. time to join us today, Rabbi. Yeah. Yes. Oh, pleasure. Maybe this is better. You get a little bit more. Yeah. You All right. Are somewhere. you away? Well, obviously. The shelves, and you can see the uh, <clears throat> other, see a little. Uh, Sun God, sun A little decor there, yeah. The Where are God. you? Uh, I'm in Mazalan, Mexico. Good for oh. you. Well, I'm hiding from the cartel. <laughs> <laughs> they won't get I don't they won't think get you have there. anything they want. <laughs> there, you know, That's the wrong place to be hiding from them. <laughs> oh. I'm doing my best. I'm not a professional hider. <laughs> Is it as beautiful as I told you it was? Uh, so far, so good. Yes, it's uh, it's it's got a huge malacan, and and I I got here even in time for carnival. Oh, oh wow! Wow! Oh, that's right. It's Mardi Gras time. Uh, oh, was... you can party hardy. So last night was the last night of carnival, and. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I got in, I took a nap in the afternoon, and then I went out and I saw the whole parade. Good, and then, um, nice. At night, they had a concert right outside of the hotel. Wow. Oh, nice. <laughs> Good, they, they set all that entertainment for you. Yeah, so I went on the roof and I could see the, the concert a little bit. Yeah, and, nice. Great. Then I could- You still have the, to come back eventually. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, we no, need. you deserve a vacation. Stay, have fun. He does have, he does deserve the vacation, but he does need to come back. This is your alternate to the Well, I wasn't break. talking permanently, but a little no, 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 no. is a little well, better. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Hi, Lorraine. Hello. Everyone looks good. Hi, Lorraine. I think B is uh, coming on, so we should wait till her. Let me find my prayers here. Uh, sure. B, B, you're on two things. Two? I should. Uh, you, got two, you got two. Um, two screens. Twice. Well, let me make sure I'm off. It's the. Um, there you go. Okay, I just what I I use my phone. 
and I put the uh, Parsha up on my iPad. This is bigger, and I, 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 can read use, I do the iPad too, and then I, but I use the computer for the. I get more people to see on that one. That's why. I see everybody. Yep. And I see well, I'm on a laptop. Glad I put on my lipstick then. Well, let us uh, begin. Uh, again, uh, mute yourselves if you're not speaking and make sure that your video is on so that we can see your smiling faces. And uh, let us begin again. Welcome Rabbi from Mexico. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a yes. joy to have you here and appreciate you taking the time off your vacation. So let us begin with a blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai. Adonai. Asher. It's Ivanu. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the world, who has sanctioned us with commands, and the commands of Torah. Torah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Where shall we begin? And thank you, Steve. And you. can hear me or see me, just let me know, and I'll do my best to try to fix it. Everybody can hear me and see me? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So today we're on page beginning on page ninety. We're on, uh, we're doing Perak Bet of Pekude, the obligation of giving charity, comma sadaka. So this raises uh, a, a very important value in Judaism, which is of course giving and helping and caring. And uh, I would right away like to divide sadaka into two parts. There's giving to causes, institutions, um, you know, anything broad. And then there's helping another person, you know, that uh, in our direct interpersonal relationship. So I, I think that there is uh, a, a distinction, of course. So uh, giving to our synagogue is very important to keep the synagogue going, but it's very different than helping you know, a, a friend who's fallen on hard times and, you know, needs help making their mortgage payment or something. So um, with that said, let's open it up at the beginning for a few short comments. Uh, any uh, responses to either the, the uh, essay in particular or the concept of Sadaka that you'd like us to open with, things that are of a broad consequence, let's say. Okay, anybody like to start? Pam or Ray, Lorraine, Marsha? Yes, Pam. Um, my uh, grandchildren who um, belong to a synagogue down in Maryland, I, I'm very impressed in the younger grades how much they emphasize the Sadaka thing. The kids uh, bring something in every week. They have a person of the day who goes around and collects. Um, so every week they talk about Sadaka and its importance. And this is in, uh, you know, like first grade. Hmm. That, that's, the, and, and, and there we, we see something that values are best communicated through action. So by bringing around a, a, a Sadaka box every week at the beginning or the end of class or whatever, you, you really, um, the kids get used to the concept by seeing it being done every week. And I, I remember in one of the pre previous uh, schools that I was involved in, that one week we didn't do it and the kids were like, what happened to the Sadaka? You know, and they, you know, their parents gave him the, gave, gave them coins or a dollar or whatever to put in and they had nowhere to put their dollar. And, and they're like, what happened? You know, it's Sadaka. So it, it, it's uh, not only important to put it in the curriculum, but it, if it's part of the regular thing. We don't have a tzedakah box when we walk in the in the temple, do we? Uh, um, um, no. Uh, I think in- We used uh, to, didn't we there, used to have something? There was, a, there yeah. was a, a box on the desk as you entered the, uh, the, the building. Yeah. And you could put your spare change in there. Yeah. 
I remember. I don't know where if it's still there or not. Yeah. It was um, there for years. But it's nice if there's a big, you know, freestanding thing that's like a sculpture and it's kind of pretty. And it's also also serves as a Sadaka box. Um, okay, other comments. Thank you, Pam. And uh, you know, our wishes are with you. Your your mom is very sick in the oh. East Coast. So we um, you know, we pray for her and with you. Uh, other comments? Yes, Marsha, and then Steve. I like the idea of anonymous Sadaka, I think. <laughs> And which is supposed to be the highest form for what I was told. And that's right. And yeah, and I just think that that's, in my mind, that's the the purest form of, of charity is to do it without expecting any praise or any commendation. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we'll, we'll hopefully get into this more this morning. Anonymous Sadaka, I could see benefits and deficits. Um, it, it somehow, to just uh, give the other side from Marsha, it seems more meaningful if you're helping somebody that you're, you know, quite, uh, you know, friendly with and knowledgeable with. But that's a different situation. But yeah. I mean, just a general donation, like when, you know, to a cause or whatever it is. Steve yeah. has his hand up. I mean, certainly, Marsh, that's what Maimonides puts at the top is anonymous. Um, mm -hmm. Steve. Uh, okay. Steve Hang on. Um, I wish that uh, our temple would do more um, social justice projects. I feel like we're missing the boat. I know that we're doing the food drive. It's an ongoing thing, which is which is tremendous. But uh, there are other opportunities out there in the Phoenix area that we could we could do, um, and it'd be <clears throat> more beneficial for everyone to join in and do something. So uh, I don't know who's in charge of the social justice committee, or if there is one. There, there, there is no one in charge, and there is no committee, and that's why there's not much going on. Um, we did um, um, have a, um, a, a gentleman who was agreed to be on the board, and then we tried to give him that portfolio, and he did, you know, seem to want to do something with it, but, you know, when it came, you know, within a few weeks, uh, he, he decided he didn't want to do it, and he resigned from the board, and never took on the portfolio. So um, we have no social justice committee effectively. We so, did have Sandy Shedroff working on things like that for quite a while. And I know at good. one point we contributed to some, there was a, um, there's a s school in uh, Phoenix, I guess that brings in the homeless children mm -hmm. and they need clothes and they need support in, you know, uh, the, the organization needs support and, and donations of, of in-kind items. And, but we haven't done it. And they need breakfast. Yes, well, food, yeah, that's what I'm saying, food, but they needed socks and underwear and things like that. Right, right. So we worked on that for quite a while, but I know we haven't for a while. Now, before- Is that Chrysalis? What? Say again? Is that the name of that chrysalis? The name of that organization? Might be. I don't remember. Because they have a, they have a, a thrift shop um, downtown. It happens to be near the Phoenix Art Museum, and it's a nice thrift shop. Actually. Isn't chrysalis more working with um, but, but like, who need uh, who are looking for jobs, etc.? Is that that? No, no, no. It goes to some kind of children's organization. Oh, okay. So okay. I very frequently donate there, but it, it's a schlep. But I'm in that area. Reva. Yeah, I like the reminders for the food bank. I know sometimes there's cans of food in the temple and somebody must be hauling them over to the food bank, but also a reminder to donate to them cash or checks, whatever. I, I think maybe we should, we should be reminded of that on a very regular basis. I like um, being cued for things like that. Okay. Um, 
Is there anyone here who's interested in sharing a social action committee? So, or if you know of anyone, let us know. Steve? I, I would be on the committee. I don't know if I'm going to chair it or not, but I would be on the committee. Okay. Um, now, our president, Faye Henning Bryan, she was the chair before she became president, but uh, we she tried to turn it over to someone else, and and then the whole thing fell apart. So, um, so we it is a priority to try to put it together again. Um, and uh, now, under her chair woman'ship, there there was a clothing drive for immigrant children, and uh, we did raise quite a bit of money, and we bought quite a lot of clothes, and it was quite. I, I went with her to buy clothes at a Goodwill and I was in charge of picking out the pants for little boys and she picked out pants for little girls. And when we got to the checkout, we realized she'd picked out 25 pairs of pants and I'd picked out 25 pairs of pants, purely coincidentally. And in the, for the little kids, because they outgrow things, the, the well, you know, they, they were very fancy clothes, are very almost new, like practically new. And I quickly looked at the men's pants and, you know, I guess because men don't grow, the, the pants looked mostly a little bit shabby. But if I could fit into the little boys' uh, pants, <laughs> it would have been much more of an attractive store. Like um, they don't have a place to... Um wash their clothes. That's why the socks and underwear is a big deal with the, uh, uh, the homeless kids, or the kids who are living in some kind of a motel kind of situation. And, and they, you know, uh, they come into school every day. Okay, Lorraine and then Cy. Okay, I have a question. We see on the TV and on the computer that the kids are going, a lot of the people going in what to learn countries right now in house does anyone know you froze up i couldn't hear you did you oh, i'll try again i said we see on the media that the children in particular the children are going to somewhere in phoenix for housing for living and I'm just putting myself as a mother thinking if this was me and I had to quickly grab a little bag and move my child with their teddy bears and love stuff. Where in, in Phoenix are they sending these children? Where would we make a donation? I mean, we don't get, we're not getting the information. Could you hear me now, Marsha? Yeah, can hear you clearly. I'm not sure any of us have an answer. Okay. No, they move them in the middle of the night. They move them in the middle of the night? That's right. Okay, well, that, that's great for safety, but they have to live. They have to go to school eventually. Where are they housed? Who's taking them in? G? Uh, G. Um, I don't, Lorraine, I don't know about that. I know that they're living under the bridges everywhere where you go here, but there is a proposal in Phoenix to build a facility for homeless families. And I, I'm not sure where it's at, but I know that it's in, in the workings because we have so many homeless people. Too little, too little. Yes. That's all I know. Uh, Bernie? As an aside, Chrysalis is a is a place for uh, dom victims of domestic abuse. Okay. All right, well, it, it's my error that I confused the name of the organization. Um, the thrift shop that I contribute to is f for children, but I guess the, uh, the name of, of the, the charity escapes me. Sorry. I, I'm always wondering why charitable groups in Israel have to try to get money in the United States. 
I see ads on television for yes. situations in Israel that it would seem to me the Israelis themselves, the nature of the Israeli government would take care of. And why I, they have to come to the United States or perhaps even to England or, or wherever to go to get money is something beyond me. I think those are fake ads. They definitely can see an opportunity. And, you know, if there's people who are philanthropic, there will be charities of whatever sort that- I don't think, yeah, I don't think those are real. Um, but uh, clearly there's a lot of, so, um, you know, of uh, charitable organizations in Israel for, from Israelis for Israelis, and there's, there's government aid and so forth. I mean, there, you can never do too much, but- Well, let me ask you, do they have homeless people in Israel? I haven't, I, my trip to Israel was canceled, as you recall, so I have no, no recent knowledge on it. But when I was a student there a long time ago, I didn't ever hear about that. But, um, but you know, I'm sure there were some, and I'm sure there are more now. Marsha. There is a non-Jewish organization that is collecting for the poor, starving people of Israel. And if you watch that ad, it is so fake. And I really would advise people to either check out the organization before donating or just scroll on by because it doesn't even seem um, real. It's not, it's not. Yeah. I, did, I did a survey on it, it's not real. They got a bunch of old bubbies and they made them, you know, lean over so that they look like they're crippled and they want $25 a month for you to send them food, but it's not real. They're, they're Jews for Christ yeah. is what they are. Yeah. Um, and, and I saw something like that from a missionary group in Central America and they, they told such stories, you know, about all these kids starving to death in right. Central America, but they didn't say which country. And, you know, <laughs> when I tried to check out what they were actually talking about there wasn't any details it was all extremely vague but very 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 extreme so you have to be careful i guess and there is a um um there is one or more websites that rank charities and how uh, responsible they are like you know charity that spends 85 percent of its money on administration costs means high salaries for their executives and I know there's people that don't like goodwill because apparently its CEO earns a half a million dollars or so a year. Um, and, um, you know, so, um, you know, everyone makes their own judgments. Uh, a goodwill would argue that that's what, uh, that's what high ranking um, executives for the charitable sector earn. And if they want a good CEO, that's what they have to pay. Uh, Marsha. I was starting the um, Parsha and I see where people were over donating and Moses says stop stop it's too much and I just can't imagine any organization nowadays saying stop stop it's too much. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, Moses had a particular you know he was raising money specifically for a one you know for for one particular cause and, um, you know, and he obviously was a responsible person who wasn't trying to waste donations. So it, I guess it's different than the charitable sector today. All right, let's start. We're on page 90 on the right-hand column at the top, the obligation giving charity to Tzedakah. Who'd like to read? Okay, Riva. Uh, the Obligation of Giving Charity to Daka. This Torah portion contains a remarkable story and give it about giving charity or Daka. Moses gathers the people of Israel together and invites them to contribute to the building of their sanctuary. Let all of those whose heart, hearts move them bring forward their gifts of gold, silver, and copper, precious linens, yarns, and goats hair, along with spices, valuable skins, and precious stones. Apparently Moses was a persuasive fundraiser because not long after he had invited the people to give, the 
Bazalel and Ohar Liab, Liab, whom he has appointed to oversee the building of the sanctuary, came to him and told him, the people are bringing more than is needed. So Moses stops the building campaign. He tells the people, you are giving more charity than can be used. It is an amazing and surprising report. In the process of interpreting its meaning, many commentators draw a very subtle distinction between support for public institutions and tzedakah for the needy. While the first biblical sanctuary seems to have been constructed from the generosity of those whose hearts move them, we are also informed that the sanctuary and later the Jerusalem temple were maintained by a system of tithes or obligatory taxes of 10% of one's property. These tithes were not a matter of free will giving. Like our contemporary taxes, they were collected by community or government representatives and were distributed by the king or those in authority. During the medieval period, such communal taxes were allocated not only to support local synagogues, but to maintain all other Jewish communal institutions, including schools, libraries, courts, jails, health facilities, ritual baths, and the mikvot, shelters for the poor and hungry, cemeteries, and the supervision of kashrut or standards of food preparation for the community. Okay, thank you, Riva. Okay, comments. Yes, Sai. Well, the first question is, and I think we might have mentioned this before, is where did these people after 40 years in the desert get all this, uh, this loot, so to speak, to give to the temple? You know, where did the gold and the silver and the furs and all these things come from, for one thing? And secondly, once you talk about, once you talk about a, 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 a tax, then you're not talking about charity anymore. And this is what's happening here. They're, they're asked to, to give a percentage uh, to, the, uh, to the institution. And charity is, is gone when you, when you talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Responses? Yes, Pam. Yeah, I, I agree with Sai. There's a big difference between a tax and charity. Taxes are, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a say in it. <laughs> so, uh, which do you prefer? Well, I think I prefer charity, but in in real life, taxes are probably more realistic on to get things uh, funded. Uh, so, if you rely on people just to voluntarily donating ten percent, it you may be waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, in America, we do have a system in part, uh, at least in theory, where a lot of your charitable contributions can be used to offset taxes. So that was designed to encourage charitable donations. Um, and that was partially explains why Americans at least are perceived as more charitable than people in other in some other countries, where giving money to charity is strictly you know strictly a a loss, if you will. Whereas in America, you may be able to deduct it. Bernie, two things. <clears throat> First, the Mormon Church does quite well with tithes. They um, it, it's a ten percent tax, and they apparently works well for them. I wish our synagogue were as wealthy as the Mormon church. Um, and I forgot what the second thing was. Uh, now my congregation in Georgia had a 2%. Uh, so so the, um, the dues, there was no dues number. It was supposed to be 2% of pre-tax income. You know, and we, hmm. we let cheat a little bit, but it was pretty well known what, you know, you were supposed to give relative to your situation. So uh, if you were, for example, a, a single um, lawyer working, you know, on your own without a law firm, it was a certain level that, you know, you were expected. And if you gave about that level, nobody's going to 
you know, check whether it was actually 2%, but, uh, but that worked, that worked pretty well, you know, that, that worked pretty well. In our community, that wouldn't work because many or most people are retired. So you'd need a more complicated formula to, uh, to reach a 2% that would, would be effective. Um, anyone else comments, responses to this, uh, this paragraph? Do you, do you, do you like the, the, this uh, paragraph at the end about the medieval, um, the medieval institutions? Uh, I was a tour guide for a, a while in Beta Tfutsot, which is the Museum of the Diaspora at Tel Aviv University. And I think it has a new name and it definitely has all new exhibits. But um, uh, they had these models of the medieval Jewish uh, community, you know, and they showed how, you know, money raised through tzedakah was used to fund the poorhouse, and you could see what the poorhouse looked like, and the synagogue, and the cemetery, and they had their own health facilities and everything. And this was in part the idea of our founders, where our technical name uh, originally was, you know, TBS uh, synagogue plus Jewish center, you know, that a Jewish center would be more encompassing. Um, but today is a very different world and we don't necessarily need the Jewish community to provide a lot of these services. And even poor people don't necessarily need the Jewish community they can go to all sorts of general char charities, whereas in the medieval period, uh, every community had to take care of their own. You couldn't, you know, a Jewish poor person in 1300 in Germany couldn't go to the Catholic Church, for example. That just, you know, that's not how things work. Responses. Okay, let's keep going then. Who'd like to read? Thank you, Riva. Okay, Marsha, thank you. We're at the very bottom of page 90, right in column, given charity. Marsha, you muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Giving charity beyond the taxes collected by the community to support the needy and maintain institutions, including synagogues, was always considered a mitzvah, an obligation and responsibility of every Jew. The Torah instructs Jews to leave the corners of their fields for the strangers, the, wid the poor, <coughs> the widows, and the orphans. Later, the rabbis emphasized that providing for the poor brings one into the presence of God and those who use their energies for helping others less fortunate them than themselves shall be rewarded with long life, prosperity, and honor. Indeed, giving aid to the poor was considered so important a commandment that Zutra, a leader of the Babylonian Jewish community at the beginning of the fifth century teaches that even a poor person must give to charity. From Proverbs. Uh, okay. Should we do the box? Stop for a second. Um, uh, responses to this. Um, uh, 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 Harvey Fields here traces this obligation to give tzedakah to the Torah. What in the Torah specifically is he referring to? There's a, a, there's, a speci there's a specific mention here of something. Answer the phone. <laughs> it's me and I'm going to put it on mute. I'm not going to listen. Okay. okay, anyone? What in the Torah was referenced here? Ah, oh, thank you. Well, I'll, well uh, well, to uh, leave the corners of the fields right, yeah. for the stranger, the poor, the widows, the orphans. Okay, thank you. What do they call that edges? I forgot the word for it. There's a name for that. Uh, like leaving those pieces available to the poor. I'm not sure. Gleaning. Yeah. Gleaning. is gleaning, yeah. Gleaning, okay. So... 
So uh, what do you think of this original idea? So it, this is obviously once the Jews are already settled in Israel and somebody's got a farm. And uh, so the Torah says you should leave the corners of your field unharvested. So if you have apple trees and you have, I don't know, 300 apple trees, you leave two or three in each corner. Yes, Pam. I like this concept because the person who needs it can go out with pride and go on their own, you know, without feeling like they're taking charity, can go out on their own to these fields and harvest these corners. Mm -hmm. So it's it's leaving them independent. They don't you don't have to bring a a, a, a one of those big baskets of of, of apples and drop it off in front of their house, or you don't have to make them stand in a food line. You, they can just go out and take apples. What, what might be a problem of this system? People who don't need it go out and steal it. Okay, yeah. so you could have people, whether it's teenagers or other, you know, in the worst case scenario, you could have people to go out the very first night and take all the apples and then resell them <laughs> you know they could set up a little uh pop-up stand and get sell apples at a cheaper price than the farmer and so it's it is subject to abuse and that's one of the reasons why you know charities have to have you know systems and checks and balances and records and and that's one of the reasons why you have to have people that are taking assistance, you know, report things and register and prove that their eligibility and so forth, which is not nice, but it's kind of, I guess, inevitable. I mean, this system could work in a little town where everybody knows each other and everyone trusts each other, you know, or, or in a very intimate kind of environment. But once it gets big, like... Next year in Is trouble, it, but, Marcia. but if like our food banks locally, people don't have to, if they want something, they can go and ask. They don't have to show the need. I don't think they have to. No. Yeah. So it they, works kind of the same way as this. It's sort of the same. Yeah. Okay. It's an honor system. Yeah. Uh, Riva and then Sai and then anyone else? Now, I used to teach classes at a number of places in the greater Phoenix area uh, at um, housing places that were for low income people. And we always had to be very careful when scheduling our classes because we didn't want to interfere with the food, food pantry schedule. Because there were so many people who really absolutely relied on the food pantry every week to eat. And that was their highest priority. And that was very well structured and I think very well managed. Mm -hmm. But I think the reality is that all around us here um, in Arizona, there are a lot of poor people or people who are food insecure, uh, both children and particularly the elderly also. Rabbi, is there a, is there a particular order in the Bible as to uh, who gets charity first? In terms of children versus adults or in terms yeah. of? Good question. Of what? I, I, my question was, is there any kind of an order in the Bible as to who gets or what gets charity first? I mean, do poor people get charity uh, over people who've been uh, 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 caught up in a bad situation financially or, or people, for example, uh, the people in Ukraine, how do they, how do they rate compared to the, uh, the people who need some food here in Phoenix or some situation like that? Um, th there's, I, I, there's nothing like that in the Torah itself. The medieval, medieval halakhic thinkers such as Maimonides previously mentioned he developed somewhat of a system about how to give charity and others spoke about who should get charity. 
So um, you're asking a good question we'd have to research, but at some point, rabbinic thinkers did develop some ideas on prioritization, but not in the Torah, that, to my knowledge, no. I think D was first and then Bernie. Uh, I was just um, sitting here thinking of the Jewish Family Services in Phoenix. They have an amazing organization to give charity and they deal with foster for Jewish children, uh, everything, homeless children that need a home, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a very reputable place where you know you're not gonna get scammed because there's so many um, organizations today. I know that um, that organization, I, I think it was uh, Bernie or said, or maybe it was Shirley, um, the, um, the Jews for Jesus, these organizations, they are really big on ties and make it a lot, quite a bit. So uh, the Jewish Family Services is a very good place to go and they have a good one here. Um, Bernie? I know that size question was about the order or the prior, prioritizing recipients, but today's lesson does discuss how okay. you should give, which is start closest to home and work your way out. And I guess there's an element of what moves you, right? So, um, you know, there, there's things that you feel you want to prioritize. But, uh, but I, I think in general, the, the rabbinic view would be exactly that. And remember, though, that it was developed in medieval times when there was no internet. So you, you had to give locally because you didn't know, you didn't know what was going to happen. You know, you, you had no knowledge of what was going on far away. Um, there was also the idea of, um, of redeeming the captives. So this, um, that there was a very high Jewish value on, if there were people um, kidnapped by pirates, you know, not that I want to emphasize that, you know, consider, considering my current location right in the center of the cartel country. Um, but um, but when, when someone or someones were kidnapped, by pirates or or whoever, the Jewish community would uh, would really hi try hard to raise money to redeem them. In some ways, this made Jews a target because pirates would know that oh, if he's Jewish, we can always ransom him back to a, any any local Jewish community. So you could kidnap a Jew or Jews in Algeria and sell them back to the Jews in Italy. So it was very convenient. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, if if the if the cartel does come for me, I'm telling them I'm Episcopalian. Um, other other comments in the in this in this vein. Okay, uh, B or Ray, Ray, you've been pretty quiet this morning. Okay. Um, okay. Ray, are you unmuting? I think she just unmuted. No, I don't think no. so. No. Okay, who'd like to read? I'll continue. Okay, oh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I was very impressed uh, oh, there she by is. this, this um, parsha. The um, instance of where you should put char true charity aside from real obligations. I thought this was so well thought out and it went into the Bible. I was really impressed by this human uh, explanation of how you should do your tzedakah. So that that's my uh, what what I say about this parsha. 
I had no idea it was so detailed in our Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and developed further in the rabbinic writings, yes. Okay, uh, Marsha, back to you. Do you want to do the box? Yes, let's do the box. How much should one give? How much should one give to the poor? Whatever it is that per the person might need, how is this to be understood? If he is hungry, he should be fed. If he needs clothes, he should be provided with clothes. If he has no household furniture or utensils, furniture and utensils should be provided. If he needs to be spoon fed, then we must spoon feed him. Shulchan Aruch. Okay. And and this is this is uh, what we were talking about. Sai was asking the question of is there in Jewish tradition uh, specific instructions? So the, the 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 authoritative set of instructions is the Shulchan Aruch. The wow. Shulchan Aruch was written in the 16th century by Rabbi Joseph Caro of Safat. So, and it's called shulchan, which means a table, aruch, set. So it's a set table, meaning here's the rules, here's how you live. And it was divided into different sections. And your idea is the part that reflects daily living. So this is where you would go to see, well, what does practical Judaism, you know, pre-modern practical Judaism, what does it say on any issue? And this is an excerpt from the section on, on charity, on giving. So it's no longer reliant upon general things like the Bible, where it talks about leave your corners of your fields open. It goes into more detail. And it basically says that we have an obligation here to provide whatever it is that person needs. Now needs, not wants, right? So big screen TV is not included there. But if their need is more in food, then you have to help them with food. If their need is more in clothes, you help them with clothes. So it's not restricted to just, let's say, food, where you can't let them starve. But if they have no clothes, and even if they could stay home and not die of cold, you still have to provide them with so it's not just keep them alive, it's provide them with what they need to live a, a reasonably functional life. That's the way I read this paragraph. But this is a source, a primary source, which partially answers size question. Any comments or questions on Shulchan Aruch right here? Babette. Uh, yeah. Yes, Babette. Well, something just came to mind when I was reading about the, the, the founding of Israel and so many people, young men, you know, families came over and they were, were farming, right? They, I mean, they, they didn't come over with anything. And I, I had read that when the people came over to do, to farming and pick fruit, they did bring little thermoses with them so they, you know, could be hydrated, but they were squeezing the oranges into the thermos to bring home food to their, their family. You know, I, I don't think anybody was tithing to these, you know, immigrants, these, you know, idealistic people who were coming to build a nation. Um, well, they were trying, you know, the, the, uh, in the old, there was what was called the old Yeshuv and the new Yeshuv. Yeshuv is settlement in Israel. So before 1881, there was the old Yeshuv, which were Orthodox Jews who lived in the four holy cities, and they lived mostly on charity from abroad. So, uh, and, and we, for example, when I was in Jamaica, one of my congregants was a descendant of a, a charity raiser from Israel who had gone around the whole new world raising money for the old Yeshuv. And he'd come to Jamaica, I don't know what year, a long time ago, maybe in the 1830s or 50s. And 
they said, we want to hire you as a Hebrew teacher and we want you to stay. So he gave up being a fundraiser and he stayed in Jamaica. And this is the great, great, great grandson that I knew. So that was the old Yishuv. The new Yishuv wanted to farm and create a country. But at the beginning, of course, they needed help. And among others, you know, the famous story of one of the Rothschilds brought over some grapes from France and helped the, the future Israelis to develop a, a, a wine uh, industry, you know, but it started small and, but the, the grapes in Israel were, were originally imported from, from France by Rothschild. Well, I they, think I was talking about the 1940s. Oh, okay. So, you know, yeah. and, and by that time, of course, Israel was already a, uh, you know, growing, you know, had urban centers and Tel Aviv was already a, a, a a city and, and, and to some degree they could meet their own charitable needs, but uh, of course, uh, you know, that continued. Other comments on, on this paragraph uh, in the Yordea in um, Halacha. Okay, back to you, Marsh, you wanna keep going? With the rise of contemporary Jewish communities where Jews pay taxes to their governments and support such communal agencies as synagogues, schools, special family and children's services and various Jewish civil rights organizations, all charitable given by, giving by Jews has become voluntary. As with the first sanctuary, Jews gives as their hearts move them. No longer are they taxed by a Jewish authority unless they are living in Israel and paying taxes to the government. Given this new circumstance, what are the obligations of tzedakah in Jewish tradition? Is giving charity simply a matter of making a donation when you are moved by the cause, or does Jewish tradition demand tzedakah from each Jew? The consensus of Jewish teachings through the ages makes giving charity to the needy and maintaining all the institutions of Jewish life a mitzvah a required duty. Rabbi Asi of the third century teaches, Sadaka is equal to all the mitzvot, all the commandments. Uh, I gotta find the top of the page. Joseph Caro, author of the Shulchan Aruch, one of the most important collections of Jewish law in the Middle Ages, writes, each person must contribute to charity according to his or her means. Regarding those who might, make, who might themselves be considered needy, Karo comments, even if one can only give only very little, yet he or she should not abstain from giving, for the little is equally worthy to the large contributions of the rich. Okay, and this is, again, from the same guy we just talked about, Joseph Caro, from the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. So, um, so what do you think? So what have we developed so far about the mitzvah of tzedakah? What does that mean to have a mitzvah of tzedakah? Lorraine or Babette? Okay, Pam. I love this concept that everybody, Sadaka applies to everybody, even the poor person, because you probably cannot contribute very much. It'll be a small amount, but the concept that Sadaka applies to everybody, because there's always probably somebody out there who has less than you do. So the idea is if everyone contributes, you have 100% participation, yeah. and that implies that everyone's on board to help, even if the amounts are widely dis disparate. Yes. Uh, Ray. Ray. I keep thinking back to the 30s when there was a real depression. My mother had a... Uh, millinery store on a main drag that was uh, mostly immigrants. But anybody who came into that store not looking uh, fully dressed or capable 
got a coin, 10 cents, 15 cents. I remember uh, her taking up collections from people to give to, to others who had come from the old country and they needed furniture and linens and things of that sort. It was very common for the Jews to help other Jews. Uh, there was also a system, I can't remember the name, but as a little girl, I remember that once in a while, my mother would go to this place. Anybody could bar borrow some money and uh, for temporary help, any Jew, and they would get help. It, there was such an amazing, uh, a constant help. Uh, the, there were beggars who came to the, uh, the back doors saying they were hungry. They always got a, a, a meal at my mother's house. And it, uh, uh, it was just so common. Now you are absolutely in a cloud of requests for money. And you have to be careful of where you put your tzedakah because there are so many false uh, ones. Char there are charitable uh, companies online that you can check whatever uh, charity uh, 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 comes to you. Um, yesterday, I got an email from a newly found distant cousin in Israel. And this young kid, probably 15 or 16 years old, was asking me for uh, a contribution of, uh, to help a um, handicapped group in uh, their, um, uh, uh, th they were going to have a race. Now that's an admirable thing. So I started to send some money to this um, purpose to help uh, a, a, a friend of my cousin's uh, uh, run in uh, a race. And then when I started filling out um, my um, vital statistics, I suddenly realized if I did that, if I completed it for my small contribution to uh, someone in Israel who was running in a, a race and it was very, very uh, wonderful that he was, I would be absolutely inundated with many other requests. So I did not complete it. It's too bad that I had to feel that way. But, um, but I have so many requests in my mail and online that uh, I'm beginning to be skeptical. And that's not nice. That's not going to stop me from making uh, my donations to those causes that I know are true and that are uh, uh, that should be helped. ADL, during um, all the years that uh, people needed to, to help, uh, especially after the uh, Holocaust. They helped so much. That's a steady one with me. ADL, uh, old and true. Uh, so uh, today we should, but the needs are so great. We should give as we uh, uh, are able to, but you have to do it with a little bit of uh, seichel. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ray. Yes, the last sentence she said, you have to give tzedakah, it's an obligation, 
but you have to use a little bit of sechel. <laughs> That's, we should put that in the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, Sai, did you want to talk? Well, you know, the last sentence, one of the sentences we read, 91, says each person must contribute to charity. And that's what bothers me. Once you must contribute, then you're really not giving anything from the heart. And charity is supposed to come from the heart. So we have a big difference here as to being forced to give and giving on your own. And this, this is something that I think requires a lot of dialogue because um, once you're forced to do something and you're not doing it because you want to, the whole complexion changes. When I see an ad uh, that there are floods in, in Mississippi and the Red Cross needs money, I have choices. I can send them my money or I don't have to send them my money. But once someone says to me, I must send them my money, otherwise this or this might happen. Charity is gone, and that's what bothers me. Ah, Sai, you, you've hit a very classic conundrum in halacha. So in halacha, the, the nature of halacha, which we don't have in Reform Judaism, is that you're required to do a whole bunch of things. Basically, everything that Judaism, according to Orthodox Judaism, everything is required, right? So you, you have to pray at certain times. You have to give tzedakah. You have to eat kosher. You have to, you have to, everything is required. It's not optional. So the rabbis had to deal with this. Well, like prayer, let's take prayer. If you have to pray, then you're not, then how do you have sincerity? You know, you should wait till you're filled with the desire to pray. For prayer to be sincere, it has to be heartfelt. If you get up in the morning and you say, I've got four hours from daybreak to pray and I have to do it, then I wake up, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I want to go to see the whatever. Um, so I'm going to pray to get it out of the way. That's not heartfelt prayer. So the so Sadaka is simply another example of that. You know, Sai's question is if I have to do it, then it's not heartfelt. I want to wait until I really want to give, right? So the people, the flood victims in Mississippi are a group that I want to help. Shirley's very close to there, so you could send her out there to scout it out for you and send you some photos and then. If you're satisfied, you know, then you can send money. But, um, you know, until I feel driven to do it, to force me to do it is counterproductive, right? It's no longer from the heart. And uh, so this was the conundrum that the rabbis faced. If you require, if everything's required, how do you build heartfelt desire? And, and there's no simple answer to that. But the feeling was, if you don't require things, a lot of people simply won't do it. And if you say, why don't you do it? They'll say, well, I don't feel a heartfelt desire yet. I'm waiting. And then, you know, years go by and they still don't feel a heartfelt desire. And in the case of charity, the, the, the homeless and the, the, the people without shoes are still without shoes. So there's no simple answer, but you've put your finger right on the on the problem. Lorraine, comment? Um, yeah, size point is well taken. However, um, I think giving tzedakah should just be something we do because it's the right thing to do to help others. I think if we wait to have this driven feeling and I left my bag in the car. I don't have change because I know I belong to Hadassah and they do not start any program, any book club, any anything without passing around a little basket from the hostess. And they are asking for contributions. And most people give a dollar or five, whatever, but they give something. And no one says, I'll come back to you later and when I have money. No. 
you know this is coming, you prepare for it, and you do it. Um, when the children throw a couple of shekels or pennies in a sadaka box, if you're going to wait for little kids to feel driven, it's never going to happen. We're instilling in them a good deed. That's something that's expected of you. That's my feeling. Okay, instilling in them a good deed. And, and this goes back to what, what I think Pam said earlier about the, um, the school, the religious school that starts or ends with a, a pushka, everybody, every kid puts in some money. So you're instilling into them a good character trait, a good uh, behavioral habit. Okay, D or Riva? Uh, uh, Rabbi Steve, I think the blood drained out of his hand before. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Steve. That's okay. I'll 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 let you. I'll forgive you this time. Uh, <laughs> besides monetary donations or charity or sadaka, time is also very very important. You know, volunteerism, which is a, a high uh, a mitzvah within our synagogue, is is a high uh, thing for me. I enjoy giving uh, my time and my knowledge as to what you know I can do better for the community and for the, my you know my temple. So volunteerism time is a form of sadaka, and does everybody agree with that idea? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so is that a, a legitimate substitute for money? So if you don't give any donations, but you give your time, can and somebody comes to you and say, "Can you give a thousand dollars?" You say, "No, I've been donating my time." Is that acceptable? And under what circumstances? Babette and then Pam. Well, I I definitely definitely ag agree with that and. It's, it's not just necessarily giving back to your temple. You know, if you are working out in the community, you know, you're giving back to your retirement community. You know, as you, you spoke that you were a docent somewhere, well, me, me too, for, for 18 years. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't charity, it was giving back to your retirement community and then you become enriched also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Pam and then D. I think time and money, it should always be both. It's just the proportions that are going to be so different. For somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't have a lot of money, I still think they should give a small amount and give some time and vice versa. So I think we should always strive for both. Okay. So time and money are both important. And it's just the per relative percentage that can vary. So that then to answer that earlier question, say if somebody doesn't give a donation, but they're giving of their time, then you can and should say, well, you also are obligated to give at least a little bit of money. Well, I wouldn't use the word obligated, but I would say it would be beneficial. <laughs> uh, okay, so you, you're not comfortable, as a reformed Jew, you're not comfortable with the idea of obligation, that nothing is obli obligatory, that, you know, the, the orthodox idea, halacha, not being relevant, it's more a positive value. So you'd say it's a good thing if you also give at least a small donation, but it's not obligatory. Okay, um, D, I think was next. Well, I, on, on that same line with uh, what Pam said, yes, I, I think that for anybody, either they want to donate their time um, or give a tie, I think it should be what's behind their intention of doing it. If somebody is obligated to do it, obviously their intention is not going to be as positive as if somebody like Ray spoke about, she has her charities that she donates to and she does it because her intention comes from the heart. So she has a desire from the heart to generate, to, to give. And to me, that matters. Reva, and then maybe Minya has been pretty quiet. 
I, I also put into the calculation, how does this organization benefit me? You know, not, for example, the temple, um, we give, each of us in our own way, a time, money, resources. But I also notice how do I benefit from this and, and put that into the calculation because I benefit from the temple a lot. I also think of that in terms of things like public television or public radio in particular. I listen to public radio a lot and I feel an obligation because they have out of a sense of trust, trust that people who benefit from it will contribute to it and keep it going. Mm -hmm. Same for the temple. Okay, so is benefit good or bad? In other words, is it better to do something for someone where you get no benefit or it's okay to have benefit? No, I think it should just be included in the calculation. I, obviously, we, 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 we donate or give, however, to organizations where we feel there's a real need and trust that the that the resources that you give will be used appropriately. I mean, that goes into the calculation. And then those people closest to us, you know, as as Bernie mentioned earlier, in, in sort of a expanding way. Um, but also I think it's it's nice to notice the blessings that you're being given. You know, the you know, rabbi's working on his day off for his vacation. Um, or, or, you know, other people in the temple who donate a lot of time and effort, paid and unpaid, I think those are worthy of, of um, donating to. Okay. Um, who is next? Hmm. Minya, Lorraine, D. Marsha. Okay, then we'll go on. Who'd like to read? Uh, Babette, you want to take back over? We are on the okay. right side of page 91 towards the middle. Yeah, I saw I got okay. it. Um, but how much is considered a little? And what is a large contribution? How much is one obligated to give to charity? Does Jewish tradition suggest standards for giving? The rabbis warn that while a person should be generous in giving, one should not give away all that he or she possesses. Others say that one should not go beyond a fifth of one's property. Joseph Caro draws a distinction between the acceptable and meritorious way of, forgive, of fulfilling the mitzvah of charity. It is acceptable to give a tithe or 10% of annual profits over and above household expenses. It is meritorious to give a fifth or 20% of one's annual profits over and above household expenses. He also adds to this standard that at the time of death, it is appropriate to give as much as a third of one's estate to charity. Considering Sadaka to the person who has the means and refuses the needy, God says, bear in mind that fortune is a wheel. The more charity, the more peace, Hillel. Boasting about the charity you give an, uh, another cancels the goodness of the deed, Samuel. Ha Naga. Okay. Okay. So these are three quotes from different parts of rabbinic literature. The middle one you'd be familiar with. Uh, Hillel is one of the most famous um, rabbis who lived around the year zero. And he and Shammai argued back and forth, as you may recall. And this is from Perkea Vot that we did a mini course on that a number of months ago. Uh, Bernie. Uh, this last quote reminds me of a, a chuckle over the event that I experienced uh, several years ago in New Jersey. It was the high holidays and I was ushering and my post was outside the door to the sanctuary. And there was it was a time like the rabbi's sermon where nobody was allowed to go in. And this man came up to me and said, I want to go in. I said, I'm sorry, it's... Um, 
The rabbi is speaking now. As soon as it's over, you can go in. He said, how can you do that? I, I must go in because I gave a large anonymous donation to this temple. And I, I just thought that that was very chuckle worthy. You can afford a watch. <laughs> Let him wait twice as long. He obviously just didn't get it. <laughs> so what did you do, Bernie? I said, sorry. Did he accept that? Not, not very happily, but he wasn't going to push me out of the way, I don't think. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'd rather it's have his wrath than the rabbis. It, it's not entitlement. You profit as a person in, in your your soul and your mind when you give. You shouldn't give because you're obligated. You give because you're moved to do it. Does anybody really think that he gave this anonymous donation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said it was anonymous. Yeah. yeah. He is just wrong on so many levels, that guy. Just... Oh. Shame on him. <laughs> well, he's just trying to, he's just trying to get what he wants. And Pam. My point is there's, um, I remember reading there were three levels of Jewish charity. Yep. And the, the one is where you get, they know you gave it and you get, you know, kudos for it from the community. And then there's another, and then there's the one where they, you give it, uh, after you you set it up so it's given after you die so that you can't be thanked and applauded. Uh, eight levels of charity the Maimonides in the 12th century wrote down, yes. Yeah, what the rabbi said. <laughs> yeah, but if you give it that way, Uncle Sam can't grab it off. Uh, so if you Google Maimonides, eight levels of charity, it should pop right up. And, uh, and now, you know, but he goes for this sort of thing is the more anonymous it is, the better. And this, I think Marsha and I had a little back and forth about that about 30 minutes ago, where she basically reflected Maimonides position. And I kind of said, I think a more personal is better. And she said, Marsha said, well, it's two very different situations. So my mom, these values may not apply in every case, you know, depending on how you're doing it, but, you know, but, I, but I'm not a, I, I really like my mom, in general, but his eight things of charity never really moved me because I figure if somebody were to give a hundred thousand dollars or a half a million dollars to our temple, I don't have any problem with naming the you know, sanctuary after them or something, you know, I think, uh, you know, recognizing a large donation like that is fine. And, you know, I don't, you know, I mean, if you want to name something in honor of a relative that passed away or whatever, this is a good way to do a mitzvah for the temple and also to remember your relative. I, I don't, I don't see why that is a negative and that an anonymous donation would be better. But Maimonides and Marsha disagree with me. Pam. <laughs> I heard from somebody who does high level charity, like getting people to you know, donate a wing to the hospital. And they said they actively asked the person who gave the millions of dollars for the wing to the hospital to put their name on it and not do an anonymous because they want to show other millionaires that so-and-so did a wing to the hospital, you know, you should do it too. So even though people say, well, I'll just do it anonymously, the, these people will say, no, we want your name on it. Um, my, my father was a dentist and one of his friends made a lot of money and donated to their dental school, NYU Dental School, what then was a significant sum. And they named the building after the, the main building after him. So in the cornerstone right when you entered was my father's friend's name and, you know, dedicated by. And I don't know how many years went by, but 10 years or so went by. 
And they went back to him and they said, we'd like a, another donation, a big donation. And he said, no, I gave her a, <laughs> so they moved his, his, you know, plaque from the front of the building up to the eighth floor. Really? And they what? put a, they got a new donation from somebody. And oh, they, that's they, disgusting. They rededicated <laughs> the front of the building to the new guy. Well, is it is it disgusting? I mean, NYU needed new money, and they, <laughs> you know, they felt that, you know, a donation that gets you a, a such a central thing, is you know, it, it's not nothing is for forever. Yeah. So There's got to be a better way, though. Yeah. Well, they they did a little bit, um, you know, abruptly, and and uh, you know, but. Anyway, um, Marsha, and then if B, B wants to say something after Marsha, and then anyone else. I have to defend myself. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you do donating money to, let's say there was a poor family in the congregation, or we want to sponsor a, scholar, a minor scholarship, and it isn't like a wing of a hospital, the fact that you give the money and without ex an expectation of praise, I think that makes it a more acceptable in my mind it would be more acceptable than having to have that person who is receiving the aid or feeling a sense of obligation i did a scholarship in my son's memory years ago for several years at the high school that he went to and it did have his name on it but that's another situation okay but i think a lot of times when you can do an anonymous contribution and not feel the recipient feel obligated. That makes it kind of nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Marsha. I agree with everything you said. So that's good. B. I have another point to make about Sadaka. To me, it's almost, it feels so good Don't. that I can give money. It's almost a money or time. It's almost selfish because I love doing it. And um, it's kind of a different side to it. I think being, being lucky enough to be able to do whatever I can do is a blessing for me. And it makes me feel really wonderful that I can. So is that selfish? No. I don't think there's anything wrong with a being selfish in the sense that I want what's good for me as well as what's good for others. I guess it depends how you define selfish. If selfish is I only care about myself, then that's bad. If selfish is I care about what's good for me as well as what's good for others, that's perfectly normal and meritorious. So how, does, how do you define selfish? I don't really know, but all I know, I may have used the word incorrectly, is I feel so good that I can give charity, I only wish I could do more. And it makes me feel so good. Is that a selfish feeling? No. It's a good feeling. Enjoy it. Yeah. Don't it's a wonderful it. feeling. I just wish Sigh. I had more money to give. Sigh. I'm working on that. <laughs> oh, yes. and 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 thank you b for the annual giving the the fundraising committee was about to approach her to solicit her and she gave above what they were going to ask her for before they could ask her <laughs> so it, the it, it also creates a tremendous boost to the morale of the volunteers trying to raise money when you know they're about to try to get a certain amount from somebody and they give more without before they can even ask her so it was well I'm, I'm on the executive board and you know as being a vice president and i know we re need it very badly so i gave it before i was asked because i just thought it was the right thing to do everybody was very happy sigh well, I just want to make mention that the big money, I'm talking about the billions of dollars in this country, is given on the basis of name recognition. The charities are set up that way. 
and, and they want the public to know who's giving the money. And that's an important aspect. As, as Pam pointed out, when John gives $2 billion, he wants uh, Tom uh, across the country to give $2 billion. And he wants the, his name to be on a building or on an association or whatever. And that's where the big money comes from. So, Sai, how do you define selfish? How do I define what? Selfish. Selfish? Yeah. So, is, so if you give, uh, B's example was give to charity and you feel, makes you feel good, that selfish, is that bad? No, it's not bad. The money, the money is supposedly doing a good job. And that's the whole purpose of the money. So I don't care if John is recognized for giving it. That's not a terrible thing. The money is doing the job it's supposed to do. That's the important thing. Okay, so it, it's, it's not a question of whether you feel good about giving or not. That's fine. But if you feel good about giving to a bad cause or a cause that's wasting most of it, even if you feel good, that's a problem. Whether you feel good or not about giving, if you're giving to a good cause and it's being used effectively, that's good. So Sai is removing this from the emotional aspect and saying it's it's about results. That's right. That's what it's for. <laughs> and 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 B and I were discussing about feeling good. If I feel good as a result of giving, does that make me selfish? And is selfish being is that bad? Um, Riva, D, Marsha, Minya, Shirley, Lorraine, Pam, De Babette, anyone who'd like to, uh, Riva's got something up there. Riva. Junk in the trunk to us tomorrow, Thursday, and again on Sunday. We're filling our parking lot with stuff that people from our temple donate, and the money will be used to benefit the temple. You can participate by donating something by coming yourself and doing some of the work of schlepping stuff around or buying stuff. So it's- But you have, to take, you have to take it home with you when you're done if it isn't sold. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Well, then you can give it to a thrift shop if it wasn't sold. And you sold. can give it to it, but don't leave it in the parking lot. Yeah, drive <laughs> it directly to a thrift shop. Yeah, um, the, the schedule it. is, uh, Thursday tomorrow um, from 8 to 11, and then Sunday again from 8 to 11. I'm on traffic duty at Junk in the Trunk. Don't run me over. <laughs> you get two car spaces <laughs> so to park your car and sell it out of your trunk or back of a pickup or whatever. Sai. Sai. I, I, I want to bring something up today, <clears throat> which has nothing to do with our discussion but which I find very interesting. Uh, I uh, subscribe to the Jerusalem Post. And this morning I got uh, a notice that a Jewish oligarch in Russia was going to pay a million dollars if somebody would kill Putin. Now, <laughs> how does that sit as far as Judaism, the Bible is concerned? I found it very interesting that a Jewish man- Oh, Bobby, to are you going to go? He's going to be dead soon. I think I did. Wow, and that's interesting. Um, the, 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 I'll contribute. The, the ethical dimensions of that are, are astounding. I mean, to, 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 to ask somebody to kill somebody and that, but but in this case, of course, you know, it's pretty well established that Putin is single-handedly, you know, creating a, a, a tremendous. Well, uh, my, my question really is: nuclear Where does this stand in, in in Jewish thinking, in, in in the Bible, for one man to kill another supposedly bad man, and he's Jewish? Well, do the ends justify the means? So. Um, I, the, this this would require like a whole mini series to go through. Okay, but it's a fascinating. Thing. Uh, um, 
I, I, I'm not sure how I would respond to that, but I think we all acknowledge that there are certain bad people that if you could kill them before they could do their bad things, that would be beneficial. And Putin would seem to fall in that category. Uh, Ray. Um, it might just give those who hate Jimmy a reason for hating us even more. But I think a greater number of people would be grateful if Putin left the world early. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> I so think diplomatic. <laughs> I love that. Left the world early. Yes. <laughs> so Ray thinks it's a good idea, but she's not sure that you want to have that associated with Jews having caused that to happen. Um, but of course, somebody has to take the initiative and, and get it done. Bernie. You have to unmute. Bernie. Unmute. No. Oh. Unmute. He's trying. <laughs> Bernie, try Alt A. No. I, I lost it for a minute. Um, I seem to remember there was something that we studied a couple of weeks ago that said something like, Thou shalt not murder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so do the ends justify the means and under what circumstances and how, what proof do you need? You know, I mean, you could kill the guy and then it turns out it was some general pushing him and he was trying to prevent it and then you killed the wrong guy, you know, so it's a very complicated question, you know, you can, uh, the, the, the history is filled with examples of people who thought they were doing good but they were doing bad or, you know, so, but, but on the face of it, it seems like a good idea, but it's such a ethical quagmire, very difficult. Okay, we just have time for a quick comment, Ray. It seems to me that the man who's making the offer isn't going to uh, do the deed. Does that help? No, because he's, he's, uh, uh, making the contract to pay somebody to do it. So this person who does it is his shaliach, his emissary. So he's doing it on behalf of this guy. So this guy will either get the credit or the blame. You know, he's initiating it. He's contracting for it. The other guy's just doing it for money. So the other guy is partly responsible if it turns out bad, but this guy is the main one who's responsible for, for the decision to do it. Okay, back to you, Steve, for any final words and then for the final blessing. Okay, well, before I conclude, uh, Reva, do you have anything else to, that you need to announce? No, that's, uh, well, we have a new class coming up starting March 15th. Um, nothing else right now. Okay. Hot topics. Is the title of it? Please sign up. Eighteen dollars for members. Twenty-five for non-members. Okay. Very good. Hot topics, interesting, controversial issues where we can uh, discuss it diplomatically, but with a lot of content. I understand, right, uh, Sai? Yeah, Reva, I'd like to ask you to give some consideration to a course about God. Okay, can we, we can talk about it further, Sai, off, off Zoom. I'm happy to talk about it with you or listen to you. Okay. All right, let's conclude with the blessing. Baruch atah Blessed is our God.
Rule over the universe. Has given us a teaching of truth. Of truth. And planting within us an eternal life. Blessed is the Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen. Special Amen. thanks to the rabbi for being here today. Yes, thank you, rabbi. Enjoy. Hope you, you enjoy, enjoy all of your vacation. A uh, couple of margaritas for me, please. And remember, yeah, this is your bail please. money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brisa, could you stay on for a couple of minutes? Sure, happy to sigh. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to end the session.